Welcome to Peoples and Things, a podcast about human life with technology. I'm Lee Vinsel, an assistant professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. Today, my guest is historian Ruth Schwartz Cowan, professor emerita in the Department of History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania. And we'll be talking about her classic book, More Work for Mother, The Ironies of Household Technology from the Open Hearth to the Microwave, and about its genesis and legacy. Ruth, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's my pleasure, Lee. More Work for Mother is uh, such a classic that it might be better known by reputation than by direct <laughs> reading experience. <laughs> so um, how would you explain, you know, if you were, you bumped into a stranger who asked you about the book, how would you explain what the book is about and what it, what you tried to do with it? Uh, you're asking me for, for an elevator synopsis, right? <laughs> yeah, or just in retrospect, you know, there's... It's been, what, 40 years? Uh, more. Came out in 1983. Yeah. Um, I, can't, I can't do the subtraction in my head right now. Almost 40 but years. Almost 40 years. Um, the best way for me to explain what the book is about is, I'm an historian, is to tell how it came about. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, it's a long story. I'll try to make it very short. Um, in the... Um, university um, turmoil of the late 60s, the place where I was then teaching came up with this idea that um, a faculty should try teaching freshman seminars on a subject that they don't know anything about and that they should learn along with their students and, hmm. and by doing that model learning for the students. So for reasons I won't even bother to explain right now, I picked I decided to do a freshman seminar on technological determinism, huh. a subject I knew nothing about. At the time, I had been trained as an historian of science. I had been trained as an intellectual historian. I knew nothing about social history and certainly nothing about the history of technology. Mm -hmm. But for a variety of reasons, I picked that subject. And to make a very long story short, I discovered in the course of that semester that nobody had written anything about the impact of the technology since the middle on a society since the Middle Ages. Nothing systematically. Ugh, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, there's a there's a technological interruption. <laughs> I didn't anticipate. <laughs> um. And I thought to myself, I was really tired of my dissertation. I didn't like it much. I knew I had to turn it into a book and I was slowly doing that. But I thought, wow, um, I'm gonna do a project, quick project on a modern technology and its impact. And at the time I was living at a distance from where I was teaching and I was commuting to work on the Long Island Railroad. And I thought to myself, I was living in Manhattan commuting to Long Island, the end of, almost the end of Long Island on the Long Island Railroad, or what felt like the end of Long Island. Uh, great, I thought. I'm gonna find out what the impact of the Long Island Railroad was on the growth of suburbia. Mm -hmm. And I was about six months into that project um, when I went on maternity leave and I was home and uh, awaiting the birth of my child and I was washing dishes one night. Literally, this is really what happened. And I said to myself, Dummy, when you were trained in the history of science, you were told never to write about the history of a science you didn't understand. Mm -hmm. You don't understand a thing about running a railroad. <laughs> <laughs> but you do understand um, doing housework. And this was 1970. This was mm -hmm. the early spring of 1970. Um, you know, second wave feminism was exploding all over the place. Bingo, literally in that little kitchen in our apartment in Manhattan, I decided to switch topics. Huh. I was going to do a quick study in which I would demonstrate that the introduction of household technology to uh, American homes had allowed women to enter the labor market. Mm. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Six months into the research on that project, I discovered it wasn't true. <laughs> yeah. And that's what the book is about. Mm -hmm. Okay. In point of fact, the book goes as its title suggests from the open hearth to the microwave. But I actually wrote the part that was about the late 19th and early 20th century first, because that's when electrical appliance, when homes got electricity and gas, and that's when appliances, or what we think of as modern appliances, presumably changed the amount of time that mm -hmm. women would spend in their homes. But as I was writing that up, I realized that it didn't make a whole book and that in any event, I needed to know something about what had happened before. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what the book is. It starts in the colonial period and it runs up until about the 1970s. And it's trying to take a look at the, um, the, the work roles inside a home that ended up with people having meals and having mm -hmm. clothing and having a, a shelter um, that they could run on, which ended up on being able to sustain a household. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the book's best known for the argument that's in the title, which is that these, you know, supposedly labor saving devices right. were introduced to the home, but, you know, that in labor actually expanded in, in some ways. So, how did you make that discovery six months into doing the research? How did you? I didn't make it. The first thing I learned was that demographically, statistically, nobody was able to demonstrate that the entry of married women into the workforce was correlated in any way. In fact, it seemed to be co um, uncorrelated completely mm -hmm. with, the with the entry of um, modern appliances in the household. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was only after I began searching around in the literature that I discovered that home economists, it's a vast literature in home economics. Mm -hmm. um, the Journal of, American Journal of Home Economics was founded in 1909. Um, and, you know, people teaching in schools of home economics did work. Mm -hmm. There was research on housework. Um, it was only when I began to dip into that literature that I discovered that home economists knew that um, appliances did not save women time. Hmm. Took me a while to figure out why. They didn't, they just knew it was the case. Yeah. Um, so I think when, you know, when I tell, I talk about your book a lot in a lot of different settings because of my own work. And uh, I think engineers and others still find that your thesis very surprising and shocking yes. even. Um, why, so what is your argument about why uh, the work actually increased? Because the argument is a historical one. There was a time, and I identified the colonial period as that time, but it was way before that as well, in which um, you couldn't sustain a household without the work of both genders. Mm -hmm. And my, the classic example of that is, uh, and one that I use in the book, is imagine a stew of some sort, grain, liquid, meat, vegetables, in a pot over an open... Now, how did that meal get prepared? Well, to start with, um, there's a fire there. Somebody had to chop all that wood. That was men's work. Mm -hmm. um, there's grain in there. Let's imagine this is a self-sustaining farm household. There's grain in there. That grain, growing that grain was men's work. Mm -hmm. Tending the animals may have been women and children's work, but butchering them so that they could get into that pot and after butchering them, smoking them, and otherwise, you know, pickling them, was uh, work done by men and women together and children mm. mm -hmm. as well. So that it wasn't just women's, cooking wasn't just women's work. It, cooking couldn't be done 
without mm. the work of men and children. It took many hands. Um, you know, why, why did so many, as soon as a household could employ a servant, why did they? Because you couldn't sustain every time you wanted, if you wanted to improve the standard of living in the household, you needed more hands. Yeah. Um, so um, what happened over the course of the 19th century, um, as the country itself became industrialized, is, for example, that one of the early products of industrialization was the cast iron stove. Okay. Uh, you could buy it disassembled and put it in your wagon and take it west with you. And you could then cook without even having to build a home. I mean, if the fireplace is part of a wall. And so yeah, yeah. you don't get a fireplace unless you have the wall. Uh, but immigrants heading west uh, bought cast iron stoves, put them in the wagon, and then set them up even before they had built yeah. the house in order to cook. Well, how did you get a cast iron stove? You had to buy it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and over the course of many decades, and it happened at different times in different parts of the country, um, men needed to go out to work in order for the family to purchase things like the stove. And so more and more of the household labor fell to women and children. Mm hmm now, it is also the case that the stove required less wood. And then after a while, it required coal. You had to buy that. So mm -hmm. there's a long process of men's labor being removed from the household, leaving women to do it all with their children. And then in the 20th century, when um, uh, primary schooling became compulsory, it was only the woman in the house. Right. And so it's not that the labor didn't get saved. It was way less backbreaking mm -hmm. to do laundry with an automatic washing machine than it was to do it when you were hauling the water and heating the water and moving the water and scrubbing yeah. the clothes. But the time spent went up by the woman. Mm-hmm. And with every improvement in the standard of the living of the household, it was the woman's time that produced that. Yes. So my, the other classic example is one that comes from the home economics literature. Um, it, during the Depression, um, there was, you may recall, the rural, home elect rural electrification movement. Mm -hmm. And a group of home economists set up an experiment in a town in the upper Midwest, uh, in which half the town got electrified before um, the ground froze. The other half didn't. And they gave all of the households on the electric, that were electrified a washing machine. And then they watched or they timed, or they asked the women to, to time themselves doing the laundry. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that the women who were had washing machines did spent more time doing the laundry. <laughs> okay. But the, the reason was that in those households, they began to wash men the whole of a man's shirt. Mm. There were in those days shirts with removable collars and removable cuffs. Mm -hmm. So instead of just laundering the cuffs and the collar, women were laundering the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Children were being allowed to change. Everybody was changing their underwear more frequently, yeah. changing their sleeping clothes more frequently, changing their sheets more frequently. Yeah. That's what we mean by an increase in the standard of living. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you wanted to do white collar work, you needed a white collar. Yeah. Um, but it was at the expense of the time that women mm -hmm. were spending in household. 
Did women begrudge that time? No, by and large, hmm. because look what it meant for their family. Yeah. And themselves. Hmm. In terms of status, you mean, and markers yes. of status. And, and employability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was very important. It was, it was not just, um, it was not just status. It was also employability. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a paragraph in the introduction that I really love that shows kind of how in the book you were questioning ideas of industrialization that were around at the time, because the way industrialization, the history of industrialization had been told is that it was this story of the rise of industries outside the home that men are going right. to for wage labor and the home, you know, it's kind of like the sacred place outside of the work world, like defined out of it. So it, it wasn't industrialized. So except it was <laughs> right. Except it was. Yeah. Um, and, and that I didn't understand that until deep into the research. Hmm. And, you know, most of the time I was just trying to piece together the story of the time women spent in housework. Why mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, my original hypothesis was that um, once you got an electric stove, it took so little time to cook that you could go out to work and still have a hot meal on them. Mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out why that wasn't true. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until I was putting the whole thing together as a book that I began to understand that the home had become industrialized in a different way mm -hmm. than the rest of society. Mm -hmm. And the, the easiest way to think about it, which I did not think of, is not in the book, is that industrialization is a, net, is a network. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you can't have an electric stove in your house unless you have electricity yeah and unless you've got somewhere there's a generator that's generating that electricity and wires so yeah. that households are as much a part of an industrialized society as any other part is because they're networked into it yeah yeah um i heard you talk about a story it was actually at a kind of memorial panel at at shot and the story was about your early attempts to, per, per, to um, present your work at the Society of the History of Technology. <laughs> and at least some of the people, I'm not naming names that here. That story. <laughs> <laughs> some, of the, some of the people were not very receptive to your early work. So I wanted to hear about, you know, you don't have to tell that story necessarily, but I do want to hear some, re <laughs> some reflection on... Um, yeah, and what it was like presenting this work at SHOT and that Society for the History of Technology. Right. <laughs> it was, uh, the first time I presented a paper on this work, it was not at um, the meeting, that meeting of the history of so I didn't even belong at that time mm -hmm. to um, the Society for the History of Technology, of which I subsequently became the president. But, right. But yeah. at that time, which was 1972 to 1973, when I was finishing um, the early part of the research, I gave a paper at, a, at the opening, the first meeting ever of an organization called the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians. Hmm. Uh, it's now called the Berkshire Conference of Women's History. Um, and um, I don't know who had organized the panel that I gave the talk at, which was about um, advertising home appliances and mm. magazines in the 20s and 30s in the United States, and the extent to which guilt was being used as a mm. motivator for people to buy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, on the same panel, there was a fellow by the name of Carol Purcell, um, who was a member of the Society for the History of Technology and one of the first people to teach the history of technology at the university level and um, the author, the co-author of one of the first textbooks hmm. on the subject. And he was giving a, a paper, this is women's history, 
So he was giving paper on, a paper on the difference between toys that are yeah. suitable for, I forget, it had a wonderful title, but I've forgotten mm -hmm. it at the moment. So he heard me give this talk and he invited me to come to the Society for the History of Technology meeting, which was about nine months later, and give the same talk. And he'd create a panel, and he'd give his talk, and I'd give my talk. So that was the meeting at which. Wow. Uh, and there was, there were a lot of people in the room, vir virtually no women. I, I would get it was a big um, conference. It was a big auditorium. Mm -hmm. So there may have been a hundred. 120 uh, men <laughs> in that yeah. room. And um, there I am talking about uh, dishwashers and washing machines and housewives and guilt. Yeah. Um, so as you can imagine, <laughs> this was 19, this was the winter of 1972, 73. Um, <laughs> There was a kind of this dead silence in the question mm -hmm. period, <laughs> which is a killer for the speaker. I mean, it, yeah. it means that either nobody was paying attention or they can't figure out what to say. And then somebody stood up and basically said he didn't think this was an appropriate topic for um, for the society. Uh, he couldn't see what the point was. Wow. Um, now, the irony of the whole thing is that, the, you know, that was basically the tenor of the reaction. Yeah. But I got back home or back into my office, and about a month later, I got a letter from the man who was with Carol Purcell, the co-author with Carol of mm -hmm. that textbook, and who was the editor in chief of technology and culture and the founder or one of the founders. I didn't know that at the time. Hmm. And he writes me this letter and he said, I'm willing to publish that piece sight unseen. You don't have to do anything to wow. it. It is so important. I'm so sorry it had that, that people spoke. Um, but one of the people who was in the room, whose name I'm now forgetting was a very, very prominent economic what historian said to me afterwards that paper has to go in technology and culture wow. and that was the beginning of my relationship with with the whole field which i now regard as a much more suitable academic scholarly home for me than the history of science society i just it changed my my mm -hmm. whole approach to scholarship and my my whole career changed as a result of that. Yeah. And I guess you got invited back by people who were more receptive than the. Yes. Um, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. But those were the days in which our uh, women's history was just was being just being examined. Yeah. And um, in which there was quite a backlash against it. Quite, I mm -hmm. can't even call it a backlash because um, there was just hostility to it. Yeah profound hostility to it in all kinds of domains and not just the history of technology. Mm -hmm. you, you know, know I'm shot in must have been a very male place, as you said, at that point. You it know, was. So who were the other, were there other women hanging out at the time or? Um, once I became aware of the journal, the history of called technology and culture, which is was then and still is the journal of Schott's journal. I discovered that an anthropologist had actually several years. This is embarrassing. Um, it's, it's either COVID brain or 80 year old brain. On, off the top of my head, I cannot remember her name, a British anthropologist hmm. had published in technology and culture in one of the very early articles, um, a kind of anthropological look at the meaning of housework. Huh. Um, but that was the only, in fact, it was the only paper that preceded mine on um, the history. She never followed it up with a 
Mm -hmm. um, I met her several years later uh, and discovered why she had, she found it interesting, but she wasn't going to make her career with it. Yeah. In fact, I, it was only a, an accident of timing that I made my career with it. Because, seems, yeah. because if I hadn't gotten tenure on the basis of my dissertation book, I could never have written that book. Yeah. It would never have gotten me tenure. Huh. At the time I had to come up for tenure, which was 1974. Because it was a popular book or just because it, because of the. the... It was regarded as stupid. Huh. I mean, studying women, let alone studying housewives. Yeah. You know, when the Library of Congress gave that book a number, the, the number it, it has is in home economics. Wow. The only place, and I, I tried to get my congressman to reverse the Library of Congress, and guess what? You can't reverse the Library of Congress. <laughs> Once it's done, it's done. Huh? Once it's done, it's done. <laughs> so that book is in the home economics section. Of, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, it's hard for me to explain to people who aren't my age how um, how deeply um, the, the currents ran against social history in general, history yeah. from the bottom up in general, which was regarded as so radical and connected yeah. to Marxists and we couldn't do it, we couldn't speak it in the classroom. Um, hmm. It, it, it's a wonder to me that it has become that hostility has so evaporated that people can't even remember that it was ever there. Yeah. But it was. You know, I was I asked you about how it was received um, uh, by historians of technology, but how how what, what was it like doing the research at your home institution? <laughs> Well, first of all, I did, I did some of the research at my home institution, which was the State University at that time of New York, Stony Brook. It's now called Stony Brook University. Um, <laughs> uh, the reason I laugh is that um, in those days, I mean, we're talking about the 70s now. Mm -hmm. um, in those days, the internet didn't exist, right? And the most advanced form of research materials was microfilm. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you were an historian. Yeah. You, okay. So um, I asked the library at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, I asked the acquisitions librarian to please buy the microfilm of the Ladies Home Journal. Uh huh. And he wouldn't. Wow. I ended up, I mean, that's what it was like. Yeah. I ended up having to read the Ladies' Home Journal um, in paper. And where did I find it in paper? I lived on Long Island at the time um, in Nassau County. Nassau County had, most counties in New York State now have, but at that time, it, Nassau County was rare. It had a main library to mm. which... Um, which could order things and send them to the branch libraries. Yeah. But it also had bound journals. Mm -hmm. And you could request those journals. And so I did most of my research in the back room of the Glen Cove Public Library, wow. where the librarians worked. Mm -hmm. Because these volumes of the Ladies' Home Journal, which started in 1886, would be sent from the main library, which was several miles away, by truck <laughs> to the Glen Cove Library, 10 at a time. And then I would sit in the back, which was not where the patrons sat, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and read the volumes. I was really looking at the ads and I was looking at the recipes and mm -hmm. the home advice. But the librarians on their lunch breaks were reading the fiction. <laughs> 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 they just loved having me back there. <laughs> so that's wow. that's what it was. I, I did most of the research outside. Uh, the Stony Brook University was a new university. It didn't have a huge research 
mm-hmm. um, collection. Eventually, they did buy the the microfilm, mm-hmm. but at first, I did most of it. And my, I did a survey. My, the first thing I did in the research was a survey of one issue every year, going through the mm-hmm. months of the Ladies Home Journal, just so I had some idea of what was out there in the world. Yeah. And that, that was what I reported on in that paper, the ads. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's where I started. After that, I was all over the country in various archives doing research. The, most of what I know about home economics, I learned from the school of what was then called the School of Home Economics at Cornell University, from their library. Um, there's an important section in the book about the refrigerator. I learned that um, from the from being given permission to go into the the um, research library of General Electric Company in Schenectady. Hmm. That's how I found the the um, the records of yeah. General Electric's first refrigerator. That's cool which was itself a hilarious story because um, corporations, manufacturing corporations, all corporations are very worried about industrial sabotage then and now. Yeah, sure. Sabotage now is a very different thing than what it was. And, mm-hmm. and so um, I had a, a, an undergrad, some employee who was actually a student at SUNY Albany she had to be with me at all times when I was working. Okay. Even when I went to the ladies' room, she had to come oh. with me. <laughs> it was the research for this. Um, yeah. For that book um, was an adventure in itself. Hmm. I read a lot of women's diaries in the um, library of the New York Historical Society. I read a lot of farm account books in the mm. <coughs> um, main Queens public borough of Queens was once farmland. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the Queens public library has had over the years acquired account books huh. for farms. And so it was a wonderful experience. You know, now, uh, this book gets taught everywhere. I mean, it's one of those books in our program and uh, science, technology and society of Virginia Tech that students get like multiple times over the couple of years they take classes. How, how was the book received when it first came out? Well, that too is, is, is an interesting story. Um, first of all, it was published by a, um, a, a trade press, basic yeah. books. Um, and so it was fairly widely reviewed and never got reviewed in the New York Times book review. Um, but it did get reviewed in, in journals like The Nation and it got reviewed in the Los Angeles Times hmm. book review. So it was reviewed and sold very well. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reviews were very <laughs> peculiar. Um, the one in the nation particularly sticks in my mind because the reviewer was a sociologist um, huh. teaching, I believe, at that time at Rutgers. Um, and he got my thesis 180 degrees wrong. Huh. He, 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 the review said that I had demonstrated how it was that... Um, married women's labor force participation was dependent on the the improvements of household technology. And I had to write a letter to the editor, which they published that said, I have a feeling the man didn't read the book. He just read the title. (laughs) Wow. Now the, the funny thing, and they published it. Yeah. Um, Funny thing about that was about five years later, um, he was hired by the sociology department at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, which was one floor above the history <laughs> department. Did he remember your letter? Oh, did he ever? He called me to tell me he was now one floor above me and he apologized. <laughs> <laughs> well, that 
that's I mean, that's pretty good, actually. <laughs> yes, it was. We had a wonderful relationship after that. <laughs> but um, and the the other place where I got a really negative review was in um, a journal, short live um, paper uh, called the Women's Review of Books. Hmm. Um, it was modeled on the New York Review of Books, mm -hmm. but it didn't last as long. Yeah. And they gave the book to review to um, a woman who was a um, very, very committed uh, Marxist mm. historian. Mm -hmm. And she just went bananas about the fact that I had written a book about middle class women and not about working class women. Hmm. Um, and, and she said, how you can talk about housework without talking about its impact on the poor. And the whole review was about how I went yeah. about this the wrong way, hmm. um, which upset me a great deal since this is the women's review of books. And I've yeah. written the first book to take the work that women do seriously. And she's on my back because... <laughs> Well, there's also a photo essay in the back about class and yes, there and is class but and poverty. That was I enough, knew I, guess. I knew I was not. You know how difficult it is to find the primary sources I found, let yeah. alone to find ones that were about. I mean, I have tried. Yeah, I tried. I actually, uh, <laughs> I knew what I that I didn't do it, and I tried by getting a. Um, Getting the, the Nassau Public Library, bless its heart, had a complete run of a magazine called True Romances, which was the equivalent of uh, um, auto mechanics magazines for mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew that it was read by um, working class women. Mm -hmm. right? And so I said, oh, I'm going to look at those ads. Right. Mm -hmm. They were the same ones that were in the ladies home journal. <laughs> right. The advertising agencies weren't going to create. Yeah. Different ads for... no. Target marketing so, wasn't around yet at that. That's point. right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're talking about the 1920s and 30s. Exactly. Yeah. So. So it, I and, and I, I knew I hadn't done it and I said I hadn't done. It. I did the best I could with yeah. that photo essay. But she ripped. The book apart. Subsequently, when I came up for promotion to full professor, uh -huh. the chair of my department put that review on the top of the Come pile. On. Are you? <laughs> he did it deliberately. He, he said, "Once they see that a Marxist absolutely hated your book, <laughs> you're in." <laughs> I see. Yeah, that's life like is, reverse psychology. There or something. <laughs> life like. You know, the, the word irony is in the title of that book. Yeah. But life, it, it's not just that the history of technology is, or the his, impact of technology on household work is ironic. Life is ironic. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, in the Cold War, if you're making the Marxists unhappy, you must be doing something right, Ex right? That was right. That was it. <laughs> Um, your book ends with a postscript called Less Work for Mother. And I, I really love it. I've written about it a bit in the Innovation Delusion book I wrote with Andy Russell. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you know, you talk about the, the postscript opens by you saying, like, you're a historian, you know, and you wrote this book, but that people kept pushing you about what the research meant for your life. And right. so I was hoping you would talk a bit about that. What how did how did doing this work end up kind of shaping your own life as a mother and, and wife? Um, I'm glad you asked that question. And I'll answer the question in terms of the postscript, but I also want to say something more mm -hmm. about how it affected my life after yeah. I wrote yeah. the book, long after I wrote the book, and how how observing housework and thinking about housework has changed my approach to a whole lot of other things. Mm -hmm. um, but the postscript, is, it tells the story of um, 
my understanding of the the um, how deeply felt household standards are, how 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 difficult it was for me mm. to change, even when I knew what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, was silly or a waste of time or in some senses a waste of time. But before I get to that story, I have to tell you that my kids get asked all the time or got asked all the time. Um, yeah. How did things change in your house when you yeah. wrote that book? And they came, the answer was, mom, stop trying to make tomato sauce from scratch. <laughs> Which was absolutely fine cans. Yeah. You know, I, I at the time I, that my kids were young, we people in your generation think that the natural food craze started with you. But in fact, it yeah. started um, it, when my kids were young. Um, Hippies. At, yes, that's right. I mean, my, my, my first child was born in 1970. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you didn't buy commercial yeah. you're, you're trying to avoid it as much as possible so i learned how to make tomato sauce from scratch mm -hmm. until i and i did for for many years and it was an arduous process that took hours yeah okay and i finally somewhere around the time that my daughter was 10 or so i gave up <laughs> i just bought it <laughs> so this is silly it doesn't taste any better yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I make it myself and it took hours and I was working full time and I had three children. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, something had to go. But what didn't go, which is in the postscript, um, is that um, we were putting my kids clothes and we were telling the children when they were old enough to do it themselves, that that what they wore in any given day went into the wash. Yeah. And then one day I was sorting the colored from the, and I looked at one of my daughter's shirts and it had a chocolate stain on the front of it. And I thought to myself, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> I know that um, there's no, it's not going to harm her in any yeah. way to have a chocolate stain on the front of her shirt. It's not going to give her disease. It's not going I don't have to do this laundry. It's not because everything has to be absolutely germ free because the laundry doesn't get the germs out anyway. Yeah. That, that is just a, um, a myth perpetrated yeah. by advertisers. Uh, <laughs> and then I put it in the wash mm -hmm. and I understood that I put it in the wash because I knew that if she wore a shirt with a chocolate stain on it, to school, the kids would make fun of her. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't do that to her. And I just couldn't also, I knew that A, the kids would make fun of her and that the teachers would say, it's because her mother works. Those were the days in uh, which I was the only working mother in the class. Wow. wow. Um, and a whole lot of things got attributed to the fact that huh. I was a working mother. You know, every time something went wrong with one of my children, we were called in to talk to the teacher. It began with, maybe you should stop working. Wow. So I was very sensitive about that. And the thing went in. So the postscript is about how it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to, um, the housework itself has multiple resonances mm -hmm. for everyone in the family. They're not just about putting a meal on the table. Mm -hmm. And they're just, they're not just about keeping people healthy. They're also about keeping up um, some sort of sense of where you are as a good person in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And you said after the book came out, you wanted to say a little bit more about later too. Is that well, right? Yeah, at some point, and I can't even now remember when it happened. Mm -hmm. I had an insight um, that you know I had because I first said it out loud at one of the first maintainers meetings. Mm -hmm. um, 
it was, however, before that, that I had mm -hmm. the insight. I just hadn't written it down <laughs> or thought it through. But at some point, I must have been asking myself, why after the kids were grown and out of the house, I was still wanting to put a, a, um, a meal on the table, freshly prepared, why I was still doing this. Yeah. You know, why I was still um, vacuuming the rug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And I began to think to myself, well, what is it? What is the point of doing housework? Mm. And one day it occurred to me that housework is for getting everybody else out of, everybody out of the house. Hmm. Okay. Why do we... You know, why do we worry about our children's health? We want them to be able to go to school. Yeah. Right? We want to be able to get out of the house and go to work. Mm. We want the adults to be able to leave. We want the children ultimately to be able to leave. We raise yeah. them so that they will go. And we worry if they don't. Mm -hmm. And the point of raising children and the point of doing housework is to make it possible for insofar as they need to, for everybody to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. um, and that led me to the thought that, oh, in that sense, housework is essential to the economy. Mm -hmm. Because if people are sick and they can't work, if children are hungry and they can't concentrate, um, they don't learn and they don't work. Yeah. And then the economy falls apart. Right, right. And that's when I got the notion that, which has now been demonstrated to everybody as a result of the pandemic. Yeah. That the point of housework is to keep the economy growing, mm -hmm. going, not growing, but yeah, going. Yeah, I think you see this come out in, um, you know, sometimes women's history, but also kind of like feminist Marxist economists who look That's at right. the role of housework in the economy, right? It's right. Like, yeah. And they, they said it then, but I didn't pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. I only realized that they were right about Later. that. Yeah. Um, the, the way it was originally phrased was that the housewife is a reserved labor force. Right. Okay. That's only part of the story. Mm -hmm. The housewives are a reserved labor force, for example, in World War II, mm -hmm. when men had to do something else. Or they're a reserved labor force when a guy, a man with a family dies. Yeah. Right? Right. But I don't mean just that. Mm -hmm. And and Marxist women's historians, feminist Marxist women now understand the broader meaning, mm -hmm. which is that without housework, the economy can't function. Right. And which is why um, there were calls then and there are still calls to put um, to, to include housework in the GDP. Yeah, we are. We are producing workers. Yeah, That's what we're doing. Yeah. And that's essential. Absolutely. Yeah, even pushes to, to pay a wage for it, right? Yes, um, and, and there were then and there still is. Yeah. In fact, it was more potent of a force then than it is mm -hmm. now. But it never got anywhere. I was wondering how um how things have changed between the time the book came out and um and now. So um I, when can, I was I just, can I just go back oh, to sure. yeah. my statement that it never got anywhere? It did get one place. The notion that um, housewives should be paid mm -hmm. in divorce courts. Ah. Before, I can't date it because I haven't studied it, but I know that it happened because I witnessed it happening. Huh. That um, a a, a housewife, a woman who was mm. in divorce proceedings, 
could finally charge for the labor she had huh. put in during the marriage. Huh. I don't, I, there's a term for it. Yeah. But it was, divorce lawyers didn't insist on it until sometime in the 1970s. Interesting. Huh. Um, what I was rereading the book this time, um, I had a, um, I had an experience I sometimes have when I read David Hounchel's book from the American System to Mass Production, where David has a chapter in there about the kind of the limits of mass production and the places in culture where people said no to mass production, right? Um, and so one of his examples is uh, mass produced housing. Right. And the irony is that, you know, that, that was true that it was rejected in the 20s and 30s. But eventually, I mean, if we think about how houses are built today and subdivisions, it's pretty close to mass produced. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, taste change, things change. And I was also thinking but, about. Let me just say yeah. there was mass produced housing of a sort. Mm -hmm. um, beginning around the 1880s and running into the 20s. Mm -hmm. And that was the housing that was sold by the Sears Robot Catalog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was There's some the... Sears houses in my wife's hometown in central yes, Illinois. Yes, they were all over the country. Yeah, yeah. And they're better built than yes, than the they're, mass they're good houses. Yes, they exactly. are. <laughs> um, I was thinking about this when I was reading uh, your alternatives chapter because you know you 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 really nicely kind of show that there were other options out there. Right. The way we could run, you know, we could we could commercialize it and buy services. We could have more communal type setups where families come together to cook or whatever. And for a variety of reasons, we didn't go down those roads. But you know, one of the things that stands out is you you talk about childcare and how people were not you know not willing to like pay for uh, you know infant childcare. And, you know, in the professional classes today, you know, uh, I can I know a lot of people who, you know, pay for child care, uh, you know, pretty early on, you know, as soon as you know, three months or something like right. that, they start um, paying for child care. So I just wonder, you know, like just ways that you've reflected on how kind of cultures change between 83 and, and the present. <laughs> you have another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure that's right. Um. Where, where to start? Many times I actually, because I have um, three children and I'm blessed to have uh, each of them have children of their own, I, I get to observe at close hand um, three households. Mm -hmm. um, generation removed from me. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that strikes me, and I, I have three daughters and three passionately feminist daughters. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I observe is that their spouses are doing a lot more housework. And my, my husband in, his, in our day was notorious everywhere in all of the social circle that he actually cooked. Yeah. Okay. And he actually took the kids sometimes when I had to do something mm -hmm. on a Saturday morning. Um, there's much more sharing of yeah. um, household labor in my Still kids. not equal. According to all the social surveys, I've seen well, right let now. me say it's the social surveys are clear that it's not equal. Mm -hmm. But what I see in my kids' households that it is it's more equal than most everywhere else in the country that yeah, we know yeah. about. But it's still contentious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, still you still have to work at it. Yes, absolutely. You still have to work at it. it it's not um, become a pattern that you just do. Yep. Um, so things have changed, but other things have remained mm -hmm. the same. Um, you know, it's, there are way more married women with children in the workforce yes. now than they were when the book came out. Profoundly mm -hmm. more. Yeah. 
But it's still the case that in the pandemic, who gives up her job in order to yeah. sustain what, who gives up the job in order to sustain? Um, it's almost always the woman and it's mm. almost always because she's earning less. Yep. You know, yep. there's the opportunity cost has to be considered. Yep. Um, so lots of things have changed. Mm -hmm. um, none of them attributable to the new appliances and people. No, right. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, like we connect the right. coffee maker to Bluetooth and all of a sudden like women have <laughs> extra right. time on their hands or something, right? right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. But but they know that. <laughs> yes. Good point. Yeah. Um advertisers have stopped trying to make that point. You cannot imagine how much guilt there was about whether your children had body odor, whether your husband mm -hmm. had a clean shirt, mm -hmm. um, and how much buying that washing machine was promoted. Yeah. Now, on the one hand, women wanted washing machines. Yeah. Especially if they, it was the first. It, it, it was called an automatic washing machine. It was much more labor intensive than things that are in our homes mm -hmm. and apartments today, but it was a way, it was a huge improvement in backbreaking labor. Yeah. Um, for many, in many households when it first came out and women wanted it and they saved, you know, pennies. They put yeah. away a little money to get a washing machine. So the fact that there was um, guilt in the ladies home journal is not, I think what motivated. Mm -hmm. uh, totally. That, yeah. Um, but there it was because a generation later, I felt the guilt. <laughs> right. So um, yeah. a, a whole lot of things have changed uh, for the better and some things have stayed the same. Yeah. I, I don't think that I, I, I didn't think at the time that I wrote the alternatives chapter that Americans were ever going to uh, want communal cooking. Mm -hmm. and certainly not communal child rearing mm -hmm. um, that there is a um, deep um, traditionalism yeah um, that is unshakable yeah as the as um, the state of Israel found out and people just didn't want they could live yeah. on a kibbutz, but they weren't going to have their children raised by. Yep. Um, yeah. No, I think that's I, right. That's still true for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. We're still going to be individual households. Yeah. Doing the shopping for ourselves. Even if we're doing it online. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I also just wanted to briefly ask you about COVID and these issues, just because we're all uh, very, we're all in the mix. Right. Of, uh, in some ways, I, I mean, I don't want to push this too far because it would be silly, but it, it is interesting thinking about old home-based production of uh, where you're where you're in the mix doing your job with the kids at your knees, um, right. you know, the putting out system or something like that. I said I don't want to like <laughs> I don't want to push the analogy too far because it would be silly, but it is it is interesting kind of like doing work and also doing housework and childcare right. all at the same moment. So right. Well, um, I was listening to um, Marketplace last evening while I was making dinner. And they're interviewing um, a man who, they were, they were inquiring of, of small business owners how the pandemic had affected them. Mm. And at this particular interview, with, was with a man who had started a, an appliance repair or home repair business in 2019. Mm -hmm. And he said the advent of the pandemic cut into his business. He had at that point six or seven employees and he had to let them all go. Mm. And the interviewer said, well, how many people do you employ now? Yeah. Ten. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. right. And, and why does he employ Tim now? Because people did home repair jobs 
at the beginning of the pandemic yeah, that yeah. didn't work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's amazing. I mean, you know, when, when Andy and I have been giving uh, maintainers talks that, you know, here upstate, I think, and I've also seen articles everywhere, like the, um, the trades people who own like, you know, home repair, home improvement, right. plumbers, electricians, right. they're so overwhelmed with requests right now. It's right. just through the roof. Right. And the same is true of the Fed for uh, making bread. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They did it for a while. It felt good. Yeah. But it's gone. Yeah. Now we're back to buying bagged bread. Right. The flour, <laughs> flour is back on the supermarket shelves. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, th I think that that's very important, actually, to talk about. Yeah. Because um, going back to something, um, what do we call it? Comfort food. Comfort activity. Mm. Mm -hmm. is a reaction to trauma yeah yeah right but ultimately we live in this kind of mass production society and that's how we do things no it's not just that lee it's also that you can't bake bread do your job and raise yeah. and school your children <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah 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 <laughs> you can't <laughs> and that's sleep right. and sleep and sleep yeah and sit quietly and, and, you know, stare at the ceiling or listen mm -hmm. to music or knit, which, you know, and that it brings us back where we started this conversation to what it was like to do housework in a colonial, mm. you know, the pre-industrial context. Mm -hmm. We can look back on that and we do with a considerable amount of nostalgia, which is why we start baking bread from scratch yeah. Yeah. when we're traumatized. But it's it's not a way to sustain our current standard. You can't sustain our current standard of living. Yeah. Just a question of schooling your children. Did those children in those households learn to read? No. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let alone uh, meet the stand national standards as defined by this or that body. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What are you up to now? You have a book coming out soon, don't you? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> We have to finish it. Oh, okay. Is it but, still working on it? You're writing. We're a on the last. The, yeah. We're on the last chapter. Okay. You're writing a history of the National Academy of Sciences, right? Yes, but the most important thing is it's going to be called a history of the National Academy of Sciences, um, and it should be called that. But it's also a history of a part, the the tail that wags the dog, or the dog that wags the tail, mm -hmm. the the dog. The tail is the National Academy of Sciences, which is an elite honorific association mm -hmm. that you get elected to. Mm -hmm. um, but wait, what makes, what provides the funding for the National Academy of Sciences is the National Research Council. Okay. And that's what we're really writing a history of. Hmm. Because the National Research Council is responsible over the, over the, since World War II, and I'm only responsible, Peter Westwick, my co-author, and I are only responsible for the years after 1945. Mm -hmm. um, there just isn't anything in American life that hasn't been affected by research yeah. done at the National Research Council. Every yeah. road that we travel on, as you know, yeah. every road that we travel on has this road surface has been tested by the Transportation Research Board, which is part of the National Research Council. Yeah. So. I always tell I always tell grad students and others interested in, um, you know, researching this or that topic. I ask them, have they looked in the NRC uh, archives? Because it's like yes. you'll find something. And, oh. you know, though, in those networks, uh, the networks of scientists and researchers they bring in will have been in other parts of the topic that the people right. are interested in. So it's a, it's just one of these kind of standard it's archives cent we need to be in, I think. Oh, there's no question about that. It's it is a central institution in our um, life mm -hmm. that nobody knows about. <laughs> yep. No. Including historians of science and technology. We have to drag there. Yeah, I know. They, then they discover that the, any topic they're interested in, there's something yep. that the NRC has done on it. So is it going to be a big book? <laughs> right now. It'll, um, the publisher, you know, 
publishing contracts say X number of pages or X number mm. of words, uh, we're way over that. Uh -huh. um, and how we're going to negotiate that with the publisher is an open question at the moment. We've decided that we have to say what we think needs saying. And um, if it has to be cut, we're going, the first draft mm -hmm. is what we wanted, the story we want to tell. Yeah. It's a very complicated story and you can't do it. And yeah. well, how we're going to compromise with the publisher is, remains to be seen. Well, good luck with that. But I am right now writing, uh, both Peter Westick and I are, are writing the chapter from 2001 to 2013, All which right. was the 150th anniversary of the founding. And that's when we're stopping. Right on. <laughs> so it's been a wonderful adventure. I wish I, in some ways, I wish I had done it at the beginning of my career because I have learned so much. Yeah. But there it is. Ruth, thank you so much for your time today. It's always fun talking to you and thank this was you. excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful questions, <laughs> which, you know, brought me back down memory lane in places I hadn't been in a while. <laughs>